All right, girls, uh, this is your podcast for Chapter 21, Early Renaissance in Italy, and we're going to be covering architecture. Uh, we already talked about painting and sculpture in class, and we learned that the Renaissance was this period of rebirth and a focus on the self, um, which was part of this idea of humanism, which we talked about, and also a rebirth of classical ideas. And we pointed that out in much of the painting and sculpture that we studied in class. And we will also see classical influence in the architecture that we're going to look at today. Um, and so I'm starting out with my key ideas slide. So I want you to kind of keep these in mind as we're going through. Um, so it says, architecture during the 15th century emphasizes open light spaces that are balanced and symmetrical. They often contained brightly frescoed interiors and contrast very much so with the dark stained glass Gothic cathedrals that we studied during the medieval period. So again, the, if, you know, if you think about all of the classical buildings that we studied, like the Parthenon in ancient Greece, and the Pantheon and the Colosseum in ancient Rome, they were very much based on mathematical proportions, they were very symmetrical, they were harmonious, okay? And so that is going to come through, we're going to see influence of that in much of the architecture that we're going to study in the 15th century in Italy, okay? So let's start with the Duomo, which you just learned about. All right, so we're looking at the Duomo, the dome on the Florence Cathedral, which you just watched a movie about, so you should already know a lot about it, but I just want to make sure you understand the, the most important points. So the rest of the Florence Cathedral was built in 1292 during the Gothic period, so it was built in the Gothic style, and in one of your tests you had to compare Gothic cathedrals north of the Alps, like in France and Germany, with Gothic cathedrals in Italy. And so what key differences do you remember writing about? Well, hopefully you're remembering that Gothic cathedrals in Italy were lower in elevation and there really was much more of an emphasis on horizontality rather than verticality. So, you know, that is clearly evident in the design and plan of the Florence Cathedral. What we're looking at now, though, is the dome. And if you remember me explaining to you, this crossing section of the dome was left unfinished because they just couldn't figure out what to do with it or how to cover it. Well, in the 15th, in the 15th century, in the early 1400s, the architect Filippo Brunelleschi is hired by the Medici family to construct a dome. And he decides that the best shape would be an agival dome, okay? And don't forget that word, here it is again, an agival or a pointed arch. So it kind of looks like an eggshell. And so you should have learned about how there are two shells here. There's an inner shell and an outer shell. And in between those, there is a stairwell that goes all the way up to the top of the dome and up here you have a lantern which helps to hold those ribs. You see these exterior ribs. It helps to hold those in place and gives it stability. Now why did Brunelleschi use an agival arch rather than you know say a wider dome like you would see in, in the Pantheon? Well that egg shaped or that pointed arch as we learned when we learned about pointed arches in Gothic architecture. It reduces the weight, reduces the thrust of weight from the dome on the walls of the Campanile here. Um, so if you remember in the Pantheon, remember I showed you a cross section of the walls? I think they're about 40 feet thick cement walls in the Pantheon. Well, these walls in the Florence Cathedral don't need to be nearly as thick. If they were, you wouldn't be able to have these tiny little oculi here. So, you know, the implementation of this egg-shaped arch is allowing them to have thinner walls, to have pierced openings in the walls, and of course, 
to be able to walk all the way up here into the top. And you also want to keep in mind that this dome was made of brick and it was meant to be enjoyed not only from the exterior of the building but also from the interior of the building. When you would walk through the nave and look upward at this dome, it's covered with beautiful frescoes and it's very, very impressive to look at. So moving on, I want to talk about a couple of other buildings that Brunelleschi designed. This is Santo Spirito. This is another church that he designed, and we're looking at the interior down through the nave. So what classical elements do you see here? Hopefully you, you identified the unfluted Corinthian columns, the arches, Okay, and it just looks very rational, very orderly. It doesn't look like a Gothic cathedral at all. Okay, the design and the decoration is relatively simple and austere, but most of all, it's symmetrical, it's harmonious. Here's another view. Okay, um, and our text tells us that it was based on mathematical units. So just like the Greeks based the Parthenon, on proportion and on mathematical units, so does the early Renaissance architect Filippo Brunelleschi. So you see here the nave, the central portion of the church is twice as high as it is wide. The arcade and the clerestory up top are of equal height, which means that the height of the arcade equals the nave's width. Okay, so that just is you know more examples of how Brunelleschi is interested in mathematical um, proportion and using a mathematical system to design and construct this building. Here is the plan of Santo Spirito, just a regular cruciform plan, very orderly, very symmetrical, um, and so contrasted very much with the interiors and exteriors for that matter of the, all of the Gothic cathedrals that we studied in the last chapter. Okay, so let's move on to the Pazzi Chapel. Um, and this, there's a question about this on your quiz, hopefully you got it right. The Pazzi Chapel is clearly influenced by the Pantheon from ancient Rome. And remember that these artists and architects would have seen all of these ancient buildings and all of these paintings and sculptures from the classical period. So, you know, after viewing all of these things, that's, you know, how they're bringing the elements into their own work. So what similarities do you see between the Pazzi Chapel and the Pantheon? Well, clearly you have this big dome in the center, okay? But how is it different from the Pantheon's dome? Well, the Pantheon's dome is much larger, and then it doesn't have this little structure on the top. It has that big wide opening in the center called an oculus, okay? It also does not have these little oculi going around the perimeter, okay? But everything else looks very similar. You have the traditional Roman arch. You have more unfluted Corinthian columns on the facade. So there's a lot, definitely a lot of similarities between the Pazzi Chapel and the Pantheon. Here's another view. And then here is a plan. Okay, so this is also a centrally planned building, the dome in the center, like the Pantheon. And then here's the interior of the Pazzi Chapel. Again, very similar to Santo Spirito in that it has these muted, grayish brown monochromatic tones. Um, there's not a whole lot of decoration here except for these medallions that he's placed around the interior of the building and also on the pendentives. Remember that word? Pendentives, supporting a dome, um, with images of the four evangelists. So some color, a little bit of decoration, but for the most part it's pretty austere. Okay, so here we, we have a different architect. We have Michelozzo di Bartolomeo. Sorry, Bartolomeo. It's a tough one. Um, he's clearly being influenced by Brunelleschi. 
um, taking a lot of Brunelleschi's ideas and then kind of putting his own personal twist on them. What we're looking at here was the home of the Medici family, that famous wealthy banking family that commissioned tons of art during the Renaissance period. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The term I want you to pay attention to here is this word rusticated. Rusticated means uh, rusticated masonry, which are these thick blocks. Okay, so these um, sections here, these are called string courses. Okay, see how it says um, three stories of decreasing height using long unbroken string courses. Um, that's what these are. And so you notice how on the bottom it's very, very thick. On the next level, it's a little bit lighter looking, and then on the top, it's completely smooth. So it's kind of this um, illusion that the building is getting lighter as it goes upward. Okay, This kind of awning type deal, this is called a cornice. Okay, so kind of the, the purpose here is to make your eyes go upward when you look at the building. Okay, here's another view. Okay, again, notice the Roman archways, okay, Roman influence, and then you have this cool interior court of the Palazzo Medici, which would, you know, would have contained lots of plants and fountains and beautiful classical sculpture all around, okay, so again you see the unfluted Corinthian columns, um, and this really was to let fresh air come in, kind of give you that feeling of being outdoors while still being indoors. And remember that the climate in Florence was pretty uh, pretty warm and they didn't have air conditioning so a lot of times they would have they would like to go outside to get fresh air and kind of cool off. And here's another view. And remember that this internal court was the first of its kind. This had never been seen before in architecture so of course that's important to remember. Okay, and here we're looking at another home of a very wealthy Florentine family, the Rucciolai family. And this was designed by another famous person, architect of this time, who wrote lots of treatises on architecture. His name is Leon Battista Alberti. Um, and here, it, it's very similar to the Medici home. However, Alberti has sort of rejected that that rusticated look. Instead, he likes it all very smooth and orderly and, you know, very neat and clean. Some interesting pieces of this are, well, first of all, you have the pilasters, those sort of flattened columns that project outward from the facade. The other interesting part of it is if you look at the end here, you can kind of see that this is really just kind of like a shell okay you see how it ends at the end here it's just like a regular smooth building so this was just kind of a very thin shell to disguise and decorate the exterior of the building also interesting and important is that the pilaster columns are mimic those of the Colosseum with Tuscan on the bottom very plain composite on the next level and then Corinthian at the top so they become more decorative as you go upward toward the cornice. This building is also by Alberti. This is the facade of Santa Maria Novella, another church in Florence, and this is very decorative. It's covered by these um, beautiful mosaics and marble encrustation, so very decorative and um, but also very rational. You know, notice that if we split it down the center, it's perfectly symmetrical on either side. You have the classical archways throughout, um, and this shape up here should remind you of a Greek pediment. Now Greek pediments would often contain classical sculpture and this one does not, but remember we're, we're mimicking classical architecture but still putting our own you know kind of new 15th century Renaissance twist on it. They're not copying the you know classical Greek and Roman buildings exactly. They're, they're adding their own artistic style to it.
So girls, I just realized that I'm almost out of time, so you can read about this one on your own. Don't forget to listen to the Test Review podcast, and I will see you on Tuesday.